worship the triune God who has saved us and redeemed us, the powerful one. So let us now go to him in prayer after reading a brief um, passage in Romans. Now we'll hopefully um, kind of set the tone for a time as we begin. This is Romans chapter 11, the Roman doxology from Paul. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord and who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we come to you with grand humility, knowing that we are fallen people, knowing that we are sinners, and we have disobeyed you in so many ways. And we come before you, not because of us, not because of anything in us, but because of your mercy and your greatness. Lord, in your wisdom, you have shown us mercy and grace. By your will, you have chosen to love us with a love that is insurpassable, by showing us the love for your Son, sending him to die for us. Lord, you, you are the one we come to worship this morning. You are the one that we come to seek. Lord, in your unsearchable ways, would you reveal yourself to us this morning a little bit more? Lord, we're here to seek you by your word, and we pray that you would pour out your spirit and do just that. Would you reveal yourself to us and and allow our worship to you to be glorifying to you and not to us. Lord, allow our worship to be one that elevates your name as we come to know your name and your power and your might even more as we come to worship you together. Lord, we pray for those who are not with us this morning, who might be traveling, Lord, that they would be equally worshiping in this time. We... Uh, somewhere, uh, that though they're not with us, they might um, still have, we still might be united them in some way. Lord, bless this time, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand to sing together. We're going to start by singing from the hymnal number 32. Come, Christians, join to sing.
575, my heart is filled with thankfulness. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged by the Lord. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Let's go to the Lord now in a prayer of confession. Our Heavenly Father, we do humble ourselves before you this morning. We confess that we are weak and broken sinners in need of your grace. Father, perhaps this morning we confess to you that though we come through a week of giving thanks, perhaps we've given thanks for the wrong things. We've seen worldly possessions and and uh, physical and material things as of ultimate value when our ultimate value is in Christ and Christ alone. And we've not given thanks this week, perhaps, for the salvation that is found in Jesus Christ. Father, we know 
Every good and perfect gift comes from you, the Father of lights, who gives without finding fault. And we give you thanks for that. But Lord, we take those good gifts that you give us, and we make them of ultimate, thing, of ultimate value. Father, we idolize them. We place them as a substitute for you, as the primary means of our affection, our devotion. And Lord, we place you as of lesser value to us. We confess our sin before you this morning. And Lord, we thank you that though we are sinners, Christ died for us. Though by nature enemies of you and enemies of your grace, your grace abounds nonetheless. We do give you thanks for the gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we come even now to this table, where we see Christ our Savior displayed in front of us. We ask this morning that you take this bread and take this juice and that you would use it to conform us more into the image of our Savior, that you would sanctify us by it as our hearts and our minds are drawn evermore to our Savior. And it's in his name we pray this morning. Paul says this, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The Lord's table is one of our two sacraments, those two signs that the Lord, has, the Lord himself has given us as a means to... to edify us and to build us up as we eat the bread and as we drink the juice. They are just mere bread and mere juice. They have no magical value in and of themselves. But as the Spirit comes and, and as we eat those physical elements physically, the Spirit, by His ever-powerful work in us, binds our hearts and our minds to our Savior Christ Jesus. His grace is poured out to us as we come and as we partake of these by faith. So we do that. We ask this morning that if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have repented of your sins and professed faith in Jesus Christ, and if you've been baptized and are a, a part of a gospel-believing church, the same gospel that you hear this morning, we warmly invite you to eat of the bread and drink of the cup with us this morning. Uh, we welcome, and this is for all believers. But if you have not done those things, we ask that you... Just allow the, the plates to pass from you uh, and, and don't take them they, as they have no bearing on your life. You have not been united to the Savior Jesus Christ, and so they have no meaning. But we do ask that you would watch and witness that which we do so you can see the gospel displayed in front of us this morning. And we do pray that, uh, that you would uh, repent of your sin and believe in Jesus, and that next time... Next week, as we gather together and you gather with us by the Lord's grace, you would be able to do that with us. Um, so they, they will come uh, in, often in two cups, and the bread is on the bottom and the juice is on the top. Uh, as the bread comes to you, you can go ahead and eat that. And this is to, to symbolize our individual faith and union with Jesus Christ. And then uh, but hold the cup and we'll do that together. So if I could have the deacons come forward uh, to uh, serve communion, and, uh, and we'll do that now.
In the same way, Jesus also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink together. Our Father, we do thank you this morning for your grace poured out to us in Jesus Christ. We thank you that in this simple ceremony this morning, in this simple family meal that we have, that you have given us, we see the gospel of our Savior displayed. And we are conformed by it through faith more into his image. It's in his name we do pray. Let's stand together as we continue singing. We're going to sing hymn 186, Joy Has Dawned.
Good morning, church. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of John, chapter 19. You can turn there with me if you'd like. It's going to be John 19, verses 1 through 16. This is the word of the Lord. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I bring it, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold, the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I have, no, I have find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to, be, he ought to die because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard the statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at the place called the Stone Pavement, and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was a day, it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold, your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you this morning for your word. We praise you that we can gather together this morning as a church and to worship you freely. Father, we ask this morning that our worship and our praise be pleasing to you, that we come humbly and in a manner that brings glory and honor to your name. Father, as we look at this passage this morning, it is a stark reminder of how quickly we can turn away from our God. Father, we are a people that we are not faithful. We are quick to sin and quick to not love your son or your justice or your righteousness, but desire our own autonomy. Father, we know that it is by your grace and your grace alone that we are called out of our sin to live rightly and to know your son, Jesus Christ, and that he is the son of the living God and that he is king of kings. And that through faith in him, Father, we do have a Savior that can reconcile us to a holy God. Father, we also pray and acknowledge that we're quick to be more fearful of man than we are of God. We're quick to our minds to be changed by the mob. And as Pilate did here, even though, even though knowing that Christ was not guilty, he bowed the knee to the mob and did not bow the knee to Jesus Christ. Father, we are so susceptible to this as well. Father, we ask that you give us grace and mercy, and that you turn us away from our sin, that you give us a strong faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, and to continue encouraging our hearts to know that he is king. May we all daily bow the knee to Jesus. Father, let us not obey the government when they tell us to disobey Christ. You've called us to be good citizens, and you've told us that the government is here to bring peace and justice. But Father, let us not just go along 
and say, peace, peace. But let us be obedient to you, Father. Father, we pray these things not only for our own church, but the many other gospel-believing churches in the area. We pray this morning, Father, specifically for Trinity Community Church and their pastor, Chris Spano. Father, we pray that you would strengthen their faith in your son, Jesus Christ. That you would allow them to love your word and to want and desire to hear from you, Father. And that you would lift them up and build up their church, that you would protect them and watch over them and keep them from sin. Father, I pray that in Bowie, their witness and their preaching would be, Father, a light of your gospel in Bowie. We pray that you would grow their numbers and grow their strength in faithfulness, Father. We just thank you for them as a church, their friendship. Father, just knowing that you have not left us alone by ourselves, but here we have a church of believers in Greenbelt, but also many other churches in the area. Father, we just continue to pray for the growth of your kingdom and for many souls to come and believe and trust in Jesus Christ. Father, we pray this also for the many missionaries around the world who we pray for and support, and the ones we don't know, Father, who have left their homes and gone out to preach the gospel. Father, we pray this morning specifically for the Kelly family in Africa. Father, we ask that you just give them peace and courage, not let them shrink from preaching the gospel, but knowing that the gospel is the power that you've given to man for God's salvation. We ask that you encourage them, that you build them up, that you let uh, many there in Africa come to hear your gospel being preached, and that your spirit would go out ahead of them, Father, and soften hearts so that when they hear your word, they are not hardened and turned away, Father, but they are given faith. And Father, as we as a church continue to think through our budget for the next year, and we have a desire as a church to increase the amount of money we're given to missions, Father, I pray you give us wisdom as a church for the elders and for the members, Father, of where you would have us send this money and how we should be good stewards of what you have provided for us. And that, Father, that the, the finances that we do have, the money that you have given us, Lord, that we be a blessing to your kingdom, to the missionaries, that you would just continue to grow your kingdom. And we, would, we, we thank you, Lord, that we are allowed, that you've given us the opportunity to be just a piece, just a part, that our faithfulness can just continue to grow your kingdom. We thank you for the blessing that it is in our own lives, Father. Father, we continue also to pray for our government. You've called us to pray for our leaders, so we pray this morning for Governor Hogan. Father, we just ask that you allow him to lead well and righteously our state. And Father, we pray also that you would allow him to judge knowing that he is given his position by God. He is appointed by God. Just as Jesus just said in this passage that we said, his authority comes from heaven. And that is a heavy weight, Father, on all of us to know that any authority that we are given comes from heaven. Let us use it rightly. Let us not wield the power or authority that we're given in evil, Father, but let us use the authority that you've given us to bring righteousness and justice and mercy and grace to those who we have any authority over. And may we do these works and give us, that uh, we would carry out the work that you've given us, Father, in a way that glorifies you and brings glory to you. So we pray for Governor Hogan this morning, Father. Also, we pray for his heart and his soul that you would call him to know you. We don't know his heart. I don't know his heart, Father, but I pray that you give him a heart of faith and repentance, and that he would know your gospel and your son, Jesus Christ. And through that, Father, you would continue to change the way and uh, allow him to rule our state and rule the, govern the authority that he has, Father, in just a way that brings glory to you. Father, we pray this morning for the hearing of your word as we prepare to hear Pastor Unthank come and preach to us, Father. We pray that your spirit would open our eyes and our minds, that our preconceived notions of your word and the passage we'll look at today would fall away, Father. And that by your spirit, we would know the true meaning of the passage we're going to look at today. And that Steve's words, Father, would be your words. And that we would be edified and lifted up and continue to be sanctified as a body. Father, we pray these things this morning in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Let's stand again and sing from the songbook number 53, Dear Refuge of My Weary Soul.
Good morning. Turn with me, if you will, to Jeremiah chapter 21. We'll look this morning at Jeremiah chapters 21, 22, 23, and 24. Let me open up in a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this time that you've given us, a time where by your grace we can gather. It is your doing, Lord, that we're even here. It is your doing that we're able to offer worship you're pleased with. And it is the doing of your grace through the power of your spirit that we're able to even now hear your word. So give us that grace, we pray. Take the living and active truth of your word and apply it to the depths of our hearts. And Father, we pray that therein your spirit would use it to shine the light of truth in the depths of the darkness of our hearts, so that we would not only turn in repentance, but Father, that we would turn in gratitude and in faith and cling to our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that he would be exalted here now, that we would leave here clinging to him, singing his praises and more assured than ever that he is king. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Jeremiah chapter 21, let me just begin by reading the first two verses. Jeremiah 21, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord when King Zedekiah sent to him Pashur, the son of Malchiah, and Zephaniah, the priest, the son of Messiah, saying, Inquire of the Lord for us, for Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, is making war against us. Perhaps the Lord will deal with us according to all his wonderful deeds and will make him withdraw from us. If you've been with us as we've been working through the book of Jeremiah, this passage will stand as supreme irony. We just left chapter 20 last week and At the end of chapter 20, Pashur, the very man named here, imprisons Jeremiah, beats Jeremiah. This is a sovereign hilarity at its best that God brings Pashur, the very man who arrested, beat, and imprisoned Jeremiah in the last chapter, to now come and grovel before Jeremiah in this chapter. It's a great reversal of roles. The persecutor is now the one who is pleading. But this is setting us up to see an even greater reversal of roles, I think. This entire section, chapters 21 through 24, is consumed with the great reversal of how God sees Judah's kings. The king of Judah really was the representative of all the people. The king served as the crowning jewel of the people of God. And so now we see God completely set against. He's set his face against that crowning jewel. And he's set not only against the king, but he's even seemingly set against the institution of the kingship itself. The setting has changed in our study. We're now under the reign of King Zedekiah. And contrary to his name, he's not a very righteous king. But there's something else different too going on. Babylon is no longer some faraway boogeyman that the media is saying, hey, maybe they're bad news. No, they're finally in view and on the verge of coming to destroy tiny Judah. It's almost as if the prophet Jeremiah was telling the truth the whole time. In dealing with the threat of Babylon, all the geopolitics have failed. Uh, The king and his advisors and his ambassadors, they're all out of answers. And so what does Zedekiah suggest? For sure, go and talk to that crazy preacher. What what was his name, Jeremiah? Yeah, yeah, you you, you know that one. The one who thinks he's a prophet. Let's just see what he has to say. Go and ask him if perhaps the Lord will deal kindly with us. Maybe we can get out of this conundrum yet. I'm sure Peshur remembered imprisoning Jeremiah for his preaching. You kind of wish you could see his face as he comes to ask Jeremiah for his help now. 
At first blush, it may seem like Judah might be finally coming to their senses. They're finally listening to God's prophet Jeremiah and seeking out his counsel. But that's not at all what's going on. Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann describes what's going on like this. The king is looking to see if that old economy of historical support is still operative. If the God who defeated Pharaoh is still available. And if he is, well, then perhaps there's still some hope. It's a kind of powerful appeal to that old saving tradition of Israel's past. But that appeal is ultimately undermined, says Brueggemann, by that little word perhaps in verse 2. Zedekiah's question yearns and hopes that the prophet will give some assurance that the old categories, the old stories of how God used to rescue Israel, if they're still at work, and if they are, perhaps God will do one more wonderful deed, one more miracle to come and save. At the heart of verses 1 and 2, all we really see is a hypocritical cry for help. The people of Judah were not willing to listen to Jeremiah's good preaching when they felt secure and when Babylon was far away. But now that the threat of judgment was literally knocking at the door, they expect a miracle. Peshur, coming to seek Jeremiah's help, was no different than someone trusting in a rabbit's foot in a hard moment. He wanted the mercy of God's providence without the pain of true repentance. He wanted God's guidance without living in true godliness which is a lesson we all need being reminded of, isn't it? We can't reject God as our Lord and yet expect God to be our protector. That was the assumption. That was the hypocrisy behind Zedekiah and Peshur. And the rest of this section is taken up with Jeremiah's terrifying answer to Judah's presumption and hypocrisy that God is always on their side, no matter how we live. Starting in verse 3 and really going all the way down to the end of chapter 22, verse 30, we see God's judgment upon Judah's kings and even the institution of the kingship itself. This is a divine indictment against the last of Judah's great kings, which is a bit of an ironic judgment, I think. Think about it. The king, as king, was set up to protect God's people from invasion. That's what kings do. He wielded the sword to drive out the enemy of God's people. King David did that wonderfully well. But now, God expressly says he will use those very same weapons in the hands of the king himself and turn them against the king of Judah himself. Look at verses 3 through 5. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, behold... I will turn back the weapons of war that are in your hands and with which you are fighting against the king of Babylon and against the Chaldeans who are besieging you outside the walls, and I will bring them together into the midst of the city. I myself will fight against you with outstretched hand and strong arm in anger and in fury and in great wrath. Not only would God refuse to deliver the city from the enemy, But he also would fight with the enemy and bring about Jerusalem's defeat. Whose side are you on, Yahweh? Who have you made a covenant with? Here's what's really staggering to me. The language used here, the language of God's outstretched hand and his strong right arm, that language has traditionally been used to describe his saving and redemptive power over Israel. Those phrases were phrases used to describe the exodus. And God's redemption of Israel out of Egypt. It was his strong right arm and his outstretched hand that brought them out of the oppression of Egypt. And now, now they're used to describe God striking down his own people. It may strike us as odd to hear God use words like anger, fury. What's the other word he uses there in verse 5? Great wrath. All describing his disposition towards his own people. Yet these were the words of God's covenant. And the nation ought to have known the terms of God's covenant with them. Jeremiah, as we looked at last week, is simply preaching to them what's written down in Deuteronomy. You see, their their disobedience demanded not just discipline. No, their habitual and generational disobedience and disbelief demanded their destruction. 
It demanded their death. Look at verse 6. And I will strike down the inhabitants of the city, both man and beast. They shall die of great pestilence. Jeremiah is clear here. They broke the covenant. God isn't going back on any promise here. No, he's actually being faithful to his own word to what he promised. Look over, just turn the page to chapter 22. Look at chapter 22, verses 8 and 9. Jeremiah is clear. He says this, Many nations will pass this city, and every man will say to his neighbor, Why has the Lord dealt thus with this great city? And look at verse 9. They will all answer, Because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord their God and worshipped other gods and served them. Dear friends, just a quick reminder, you can't continue habitually down the path of sin and expect to end up at the destination of blessing. And again, what gets the most attention here is God's judgment upon the king. Look back at chapter 21, chapter 21, verse 7. Afterward declares the Lord, I will give Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his servants and the people in the city who survived the pestilence and survived the sword and famine, I'll give them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of their enemies, into the hand of those who seek their lives. He shall strike them down with the edge of the sword. He shall not pity them or spare them or have compassion. From the least all the way to the greatest, even the king himself, God would bring his judgment. And here's what's so serious about this judgment. It's aimed, I think, at the entire institution of the Davidic kingship. Verse 11 and 12 expand the scope from just King Zedekiah to now all the Davidic kings. Look, look at verse 11. And to the house of the king of Judah. That, that is, to the household or the, the dynasty of Judah. Say this. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of David. Thus says the Lord, execute justice in the morning. And deliver from the hand of the oppressor him who has been robbed, lest my wrath go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of your evil deeds. In other words, it was the king who wielded the sword of the government. And, and what he should have done with, with that sword, that, that divinely gifted power of authority, is that he should have stood up to defend the oppressed. He should have defended the poor. But because the entire kingship became oppressive, king after king after king, well, then God promises to burn the kingship down. In verses 13 and 14, he actually describes burning down the symbol of Judah's kings, the Davidic palace. The Davidic palace, by the way, just a bit of historical context here, it was built with wood of the cedar trees taken out from the forests of Lebanon. Look at what he says in verse 13. Behold, I'm against you, O inhabitants of the valley, O rock of the plain, declares the Lord. You who say, who shall come down against us, or who shall enter our habitations? Verse 14, I will punish you according to the fruit of your deeds, declares the Lord. I will kindle a fire in her forest, and it shall devour all that is around her. There is no forest in Jerusalem. The language used here is describing the palace, the, the seed of the Davidic dynasty that was built up with the wood from the forest. And again, God is saying, unless you repent, if you don't give up your oppressive ways, I'm going to bring this whole thing to nothing. Just another side note. God despises oppressive government. That is government that was given by God in any given nation meant to serve and upbuild the people, and it's used by those in top to crush and oppress and steal from the people. Throughout the entire scriptures, that is just one of the re Repeated dominant notes that God is against oppressive kings. Look at chapter 22, verses 3 through 7. Chapter 22, verses 3 through 7. Thus says the Lord, he's speaking to the kingship here. Do justice and righteousness and deliver from the hand of the oppressor who, him who has been robbed. And do no wrong or violence to the resident alien, the fatherless, and the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. For if, if you will indeed obey this word, there shall enter the gates of this house 
Kings, good kings, who sit on the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, they and their servants and their people. But, verse 5, if you will not obey these words, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that this house shall become a desolation. For thus says the Lord concerning the house of the king of Judah, you are like Gilead to me, like the summit of Lebanon, yet surely I will make you a desert, I will make you an uninhabited city, and I will prepare destroyers against you, each with his weapons, and they shall cut down your choicest cedars and cast them into the fire. Here we, we really get to the heart of what the king was supposed to be. He was, he was to protect against enemies and drive away those who were opposed to Judah, yes, but ultimately the king was supposed to be a paragon of godliness and virtue. Out of all the people, the king should have been a man who had his ears and the ears of his heart especially attuned to God's word. Think about that. God has placed the king as the authoritative head over government. And we see this in Romans 13. God's design and purpose for government is to lead the nation justly. And it does so through power. God is clear. He gives the government the power of the sword. In our day, that's the, the power of the Glock, I guess you could say. But it's coercive power nonetheless. The king was to establish laws, and then he was to enforce laws. It's a good thing that we have police. They are the executive enforcers of God's good government. In Judah's case, the king was to enforce God's laws. And he was to do that justly and to exercise authority. But do you, do you realize how hard of a task that is? The minute you start forcing people to do things that God disapproves of, you not only become a tyrant, but you are also leading the people into judgment. There's responsibility with the power of the governmental sword. And this is why the New Testament, both Paul and Peter are adamant that we pray for our governing authorities. That we pray for those who are in charge, who wield the power of the sword. That those who use coercive enforcement would do so with wisdom. That they would do so with godly restraint. That they would promote peace with the land and not chaos, not confusion. And especially not moral decline. But when wisdom and virtue and godliness were entirely absent from the kings of Judah. Well... What we get in verse 11 through to the end of chapter two, ch chapter 22 is a listing of all these wicked kings. And, 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 and look at how he describes them. Verses 11 through 12, we see Shalom, also known as Jehoahaz. He was so wicked that he only reigned for three months before the Lord used Pharaoh uh, of Egypt to take him away. And then he dies in Egypt alone. In verses 13 through 23, we see Eliakim. He's also known as Jehoiakim. He reigns for 11 years, but his vice was that he used his power and authority to make himself rich at the expense of the people. He wanted a second palace with a view. Look at verses 13 through 15. Woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness and his upper rooms by injustice, who makes his neighbor serve him for nothing and does not give him his wages, who says, I will build myself a great house with spacious upper rooms, who cuts out windows for it, paneling with cedar and painting it with vermilion. That's not cheap. Do you think you are a king because you compete in cedar? Did not your father eat and drink and do justice and righteousness? Then it was well with him. You see, this king was so ostentatious that verse 23 refers to him as a bird of paradise, like a peacock, nested among the cedars. But all of it was gained through injustice, through oppressive greed. But the passage is, it's a sharp warning to those who live life just to collect nice things. The American dream, kind of placated with the bumper sticker, he who dies with the most toys wins. Those toys don't last, though, the final judgment of God's throne. But I think this passage is an even sharper rebuke to those who seek to pursue civil service, to become a governor, a senator, even a president in order to gain wealth and prestige. It's not wrong to want to make money and make a living, 
But in order to become a civil servant, in order to get rich, this passage is a, is a slap to our selfish hearts. The last king mentioned in verses 24 through 30 was Jehoiakim, also known as Kaniah. His reign was so wicked that the Lord used Nebuchadnezzar to take him away to Babylon and have him killed there in exile. Here's the most startling part of this whole passage. It ends with a pronouncement of judgment against any future generations of kings that would come from this line of Davidic kings. Look at verse 29 and 30. O land, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, write this man down as childless, a man who shall not succeed in his days, for none of his offspring shall succeed in sitting on the throne of David and ruling again in Judah. This seems to be the official obituary for the house of David. And with exile to Babylon, Israel seems to have come to the end of any legitimate monarchy. Think about this, because this is a very serious problem for Bible readers. If you're an Old Covenant Jew, and you've heard Jeremiah's preaching from chapter 1 all the way through here to chapter 22, you really ought to be in a kind of hopeless place. God is destroying the temple, chapter 7. He's destroying the priesthood. He's cast doubt on Judah's covenantal standing. And now he's taken away the monarchy. You'd not be wrong to ask, what? How can this be? Now, hasn't the Lord promised to be our God? Didn't he promise in 2 Samuel 7 that, David, your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me? Your throne shall be established forever. Those were your words, God. Has God broken his promises? Did he give up on his pledge to his people? Have the covenant and kingdom actually come to an end? Well, with man, those things that are impossible and hopeless are not impossible and hopeless with God. There is hope, and, and, and we will see a glimmer of hope here, a bright glimmer. But before we do, I'm just helping you gird up your loins for a second. Jeremiah needs to take us down into the terror and darkness of God's righteous judgment just one more level. And we need to follow them. The, the, the good news, the, the bright hope, only makes sense after we really feel the weight of the bad news. The, the, the brightest stars of God's promises can only be seen in the deepest, darkest wells. Chapter 23, verses 1 through 2. Turn there. Jeremiah shines the light of God's law brightly on all those who are tasked by God to lead the people. They bear the responsibility, and yet because they've been so bad, the light just highlights their sin and their failure even more. He says, look, woe to you, the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my shepherd, of my pasture. These shepherds included not just the kings, but also the priests, the prophets, all the people who in every institution was set up by God to lead the people into faithfulness, to help the people of Judah be godly. Instead, they lead the people into idolatry. Instead, they were leading them into rebellion. You know, as leadership goes, so goes the people. And that was true of Israel. It was true of Judah here. It's true of any country, and it's especially true of God's church. God despises leaders who fail to shepherd his people well. well look at verse 2. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people, my people, you've scattered my flock and you've driven them away and you have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. Elders of Greenbelt Baptist Church, deacons of Greenbelt Baptist Church, can I just encourage you to give your Sunday afternoon to meditating on this passage? Oh, that we would be examining with seriousness our own hearts and our own lives and making sure we never become the kind of leader who scatters God's people. I remember when it was a pastoral intern um, sitting down with the pastor who was mentoring me at that time. And this was right after a, a, another pastor we knew just got caught having an affair. 
my mentor began to pray after light of this news came forward. He, he sat down and, and he began to pray and he prayed these words. He said, oh, Father, would you kill us and take our lives before we ever make a shipwreck of our faith and a shipwreck of the calling of pastor? I still pray that today. The problem of chapter 23, the major burden that we see in chapter 23 is that Judah had prophets and preachers who failed to live rightly and failed to stand up to the immorality of these evil kings and call out a wicked society. Instead of preaching bold and faithful sermons against bad policies and wicked practices, they co-opted themselves to the king's program. These were the superstar preachers who were invited into the White House to help give an encouraging word. You know, to come and, and give moral support to an immoral leader. And because of that, because they feared the king, they feared the state leader more than they feared God, God was going to destroy them. If chapters 21 and 22 was an indictment of judgment on wicked kings, then here in chapter 23, we see an indictment of judgment on false prophets. Look at, look at verses 9 through 11 concerning these prophets. My heart is broken within me. All my bones shake. I am like a drunken man, like a man overcome by wine because of the Lord and because of his holy words. For the land is full of adulterers. Because of the curse, the land mourns and the pastures of the wilderness are dried up. Their course is evil and their might is not right. Both prophet and priest are ungodly. Even in my house I have found their evil, declares the Lord. All these prophets, all these priests were all imposters. They were so bad that there's this, this spiritual drought in the land. Rather than being men who simply stuck to the word of God, who dedicated themselves to declaring nothing but the truth of God's word, these prophets fell back on making up their own ideas. Fun little topical sermons of you know, how to be a good dad for 2021. You know, these, these were lies. These were sermons that were meant to tickle ears. They gave sermons that sounded good and were met by general applause. And the people loved these preachers. And look at this. The preachers even went around looking for who had the most popular sermons, www.sermonaudio.com, and then they'd plagiarize those sermons just so they could get bigger crowds themselves. Look at verses 30 through 32. Therefore, behold, I'm against the prophets, declares the Lord, who steal my words from one another. Behold, I'm against the prophets, declares the Lord, who use their tongues and declare, thus declares the Lord. Behold, I am against those who prophesy lying dreams, declares the Lord, and who tell them and lead my people astray by their lies and their recklessness. I never sent them. I did not give them a charge. So they do not profit this people at all, declares the Lord. God's people, until glory, until the coming back of Christ, God's people will always have these kinds of prophets in their midst. Jesus, describing today, even warned that many false prophets will arise and lead many people astray. A man behind a pulpit is not an authority in and of himself. Even if he's got a TV show and a pulpit, the only authority he stands on is that of the living and active word of God. Just because someone holds a Bible, and he might even say the name Jesus a few times throughout his sermon, that does not mean that the word of God is truly being proclaimed. Oh, dear friends, church, would we be Bereans? Do you know who the Bereans are? In Acts chapter 17, when the Apostle Paul came to preach to these Bereans, the Apostle Paul himself, you know what they did? They said, hold on, Paul, let me look at my Bible first. They examined the scriptures to see and test that if the Apostle Paul was preaching rightly. Friends, that's your charge. If chapter 23 is a declaration of woe and judgment against false prophets and silly preachers, then there's also a warning here to you as well to the people of God, to not allow false prophets. I preach, the elders teach, so that you might be built up in the word of God. But, but brothers, to use John Piper's phrase, I am not a professional. 
This is not my gig just because I, I, I like getting behind a pulpit. My sole desire is that you would know the word of God. And so that if the time comes, Lord willing, not when, but if, I start going astray and getting weird on what the Bible says, you will know this word so well that you will say, Steve, you're fired. Time to bring another preacher. What was the outcome of all these silly sermons being preached? Look at verse 39. Behold, I will lift you up and cast you away from my presence, you and the city that I gave you to your fathers. I will bring upon you everlasting reproach and perpetual shame, which will never be forgotten. All right. There's the bad news. I think that's like 35 minutes of raw divine judgment. Just take a breather. <laughs> Just feel the weight of that for a second, but, but know that we're now going to come back to the light. And, and I know it's heavy. These are hard words to bear, but, but there they are. They're right there in the text. We have to sit under them. God has not left us in the dark. There's hope in this passage. And I, I, I want to end this morning by looking at two major promises that interweave themselves like a bright silver thread throughout this entire passage. The first is an answer to the wicked kings, an answer to the problem of what seems to be God destroying the Davidic line. If the kings of Jeremiah's day were oppressive and if they were unfaithful, I want us to see God gives a promise that he would have to raise up himself an entirely different kind of king. A king who is true, just, thoroughly righteous. A kind of prince of peace, if you will. Look at chapter 23, and look at, look at 23, verses 5 and 6. Behold, the days are coming. So from Jeremiah's standpoint, there's some future event. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. And he shall reign as king and deal wisely and execute justice and righteous in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. When Jeremiah said that none of Jehoiakim's children would sit on the throne of David, he was talking about his immediate offspring. It's true. Jehoiakim's sons did not rule the people of God in Jerusalem. That line was cut off. But still, the larger Davidic line and family would continue, and a rightful king would ultimately come to reign. And the name of this Davidic king, well, it's a clear giveaway. He shall be called the Lord is our righteousness. My dear friends, this is he who was born to a virgin woman and lived his life without sin entirely who grew up in righteousness and was called himself the king of righteousness, this is Jesus Christ. And the, the name, the Lord is our righteousness, what a fantastic image. Here's a king who so represents his people that his righteousness actually becomes our righteousness. A king who is so righteous that when he enters into death itself, death trying to get a grip on him and looking for some kind of sin to hold him down into the eternal darkness of death, says there's nothing here by which I can hold him. And he reemerges, bursting forth as a crowned king. And as he does, he says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden with your own sin. I am the king and the Lord of righteousness. And if you know me, then my righteousness is yours. What a king this is. And he's a king who deserves that crown. Luke tells us in Luke 19, as he was drawing near, Jesus, already on the way down to Mount of Olives, a multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice. And this is what they said. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is King Jesus indeed. He doesn't rule as a cruel tyrant. He doesn't rule for selfish gain to gain luxury. Here's a king who rules with complete humility. He didn't come riding on a white stallion of oppression, but the gray donkey of servanthood. Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, a colt, a foal of a beast of burden. 
Our King Jesus is not a tyrant. Phil read for us earlier from John 19 about our king who was king right in front of another ruler. And when confronted about his king, show me your king card, he was silent. And that's, that's true humility. He was silent even under death. A king who came to conquer not just people, but death itself and the ravages of sin, is death, uh, the ravages of sin itself. And he did so through entering death for us. Indeed, this is a king out of this world. He's a heavenly king. Children, in your bulletin, we see in question number one, if you've got your kid's bulletin, question number one asks this, who is king over God's people? Very simple answer, Jesus. Your second question asks this, and this is a very important question. Is Jesus king now? Yes, he is king over the whole universe. He is king over the whole universe. You see, whenever, whenever God's people are surrounded by bad shepherds, as they were in Jeremiah's day, they, they, they beg for a good shepherd. We saw this in Exodus when they were ruled by a tyrant of a pharaoh. Then they began to cry out to God. They pray for a shepherd who will make them lie down in green pastures and lead them beside quiet waters. They cry out for a shepherd who will not destroy, who won't scatter, who won't neglect his people, who won't terrify them or won't even lose them. He knows each and every one of his people by name. And when God finally does give a good king, he uses that king. And here's the second part of our answer. He uses that king to give his people a new exodus and bring them into a new kingdom. When there's a return of the king, there will be a return of the king's people. Look at chapter 23 and verse 3. Chapter 23, verse 3, Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. Now, do you see what's going on here? God promises to shepherd the lost sheep of Israel, and he wants the job done rightly. So he promises it to do it himself. And after God drives the sheep out into the nations, he'll bring them back to his own pasture. He will be the good shepherd who gathers the remnant of his flock back from exile. When he brings his people back from exile, it'll be such a wonderful salvation that they will practically forget their deliverance from Egypt. Look what he says in verses 7 and 8. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when they shall no longer say, as the Lord lives who brought up the people out of Israel, out of the land of Egypt. But as the Lord lives who brought up and led the offspring of the house of Israel, out of the north country, and out of all the countries where he had driven them. Then they shall dwell in their own land. This second exodus, it would be inaugurated under King Cyrus and Israel's return under Nehemiah and Ezra. It, it, it would happen, the second exodus, but I, I also want us to see it would only happen through a, a judgment. First, God needs to send his people away. He's going to redeem them out of exile. But before the exodus, first comes the exile. First the cross, then the crown. Chapter 24 ends with this kind of, this vision. He, he, he sees a basket here, if, you, if you're looking at chapter 24. And in this basket are, are two kinds of figs. There's good figs, verse 2. And then, and then we see some bad figs, verse 2, that couldn't even be eaten. And the Lord says, what do you see, Jeremiah? He says, I see good figs, they're good, but, but the bad ones are so bad, I can't even eat them. And this is what God says in verse 5. Like these good figs, so I will regard as good the exiles from Judah, whom I have sent away from this place to the land of the Chaldeans. I will set my eyes on them for good, and I will bring them back to this land, and I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. Verse 7, I will give them a heart, to know that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return to me with their whole heart. At the end of the Old Testament, we, we see the people of Israel brought back out of exile. Cyrus, under the leadership of Nehemiah and Ezra, says, go, go back to your land, build your temple again. But it's very clear by the end of the Old Testament that there's something that these people don't have. 
They're back in the land, but they don't have a new heart. They, they, they don't have a heart that rightly knows the Lord. And so this fulfillment would only find fulfillment in Christ and the growth of the kingdom of God through the nations. This is the second exodus that Mark in the book of Acts talks about. When both Jews and Gentiles come to faith in Jesus, it was and it is even still now evidence of God giving a brand new heart. Children, your last question in your bulletin asks this. What does our king want us to do? What does our king want us to do? Here's perhaps the most important answer. Know Jesus and love him. Know Jesus and love him. Dear friends, this, this heavy, weighty section of Jeremiah is preparing God's people for a weight of glory that finally breaks forth in the coming of the Son of God. And when Jesus says, truly, truly, I've come to be your king and I will give you hearts to worship the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind and strength. Chapter 24 ends with that basket of good figs and bad figs. Until Christ comes back at a second time, we all, we all find ourselves kind of in that basket right now. Here's what characterizes the bad figs. Consistent, hard-hearted rebellion against what the Lord has commanded us to repent and believe and submit to the king. For us, that means King Jesus. We can say, okay, no, I, I, that's cool. You keep your religion to yourself, but I'm going to keep doing my own thing. The judgment that awaits the bad figs in chapter 24 is just a foretaste of a worse judgment that awaits everyone who continues with that kind of heart. But what characterizes the good figs is that they have a heart that says Jesus is king. Dear friends, I pray that you wouldn't leave here this morning without going to God and saying, Lord, give me the ability to submit with all my heart to the goodness of King Jesus. He's a good shepherd, not a tyrant. He rules as a prince of peace, and he will lead us into green pastures that will forever be a blessing to all those who are in him. Let's pray. Let's pray together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do come humbly before you this morning, and we thank you for your word. We thank you for the life that is found within it. And Father, we confess to you this morning that, that we need more of your spirit within us to continually remind us and guide us back to your word. Father, we've read this morning and, and seen how within Israel there were shepherds, there were prophets, priests, and kings who governed and led according to their own word according to their own thoughts, according to what they perceived as true. And Father, they led your people astray. They led your people deep into sin. And this is always the pattern when a heart is not continually searching the scriptures and searching your word and listening to your voice. Our hearts are truly prone to wander and go astray. And so, Lord, we ask this morning for your, your spirit to work within us, to continually, moment by moment, draw our minds and our hearts back to your word. Help us not to, to live, to make decisions based upon our own thoughts, but according to what you say. Lord, we ask that you would be pleased to raise up leaders within this church, uh, raise up pastors, elders who are grounded in the scriptures, who, whose lives glorify Christ, 
amongst us. Father, would you be pleased to do this? And, and would you be pleased to keep the elders that we do have currently grounded in the scriptures? Father, make us a church who is constantly examining your scriptures and weighing everything against the scriptures. Father, we do ask this morning as well, as Phil prayed earlier, that you would raise up godly leaders within our country whose desire it is to uphold justice, to uphold mercy, to create just laws and to to enact and enforce just laws. Father, give them uh, hearts for the poor and hearts for the needy. Father, we ask uh, that your word would continually be able to be proclaimed openly and truly, that sinners would come to repentance through the open proclamation of your word. Lord, we do ask for this. And and Father, we don't know your plans for us, but we know that you are good and that you are faithful and you are true. And so we thank you for all that you do, all that you have done, Lord, and we thank you most of all that as we look around and we still see brokenness around us, Father, we still see even within the church sin, brokenness, Lord, we thank you that we look up and we see Christ, our Savior, who is the good and perfect shepherd, who is the once and final sacrifice for our sin, and who is the good and gracious king who rules justly and righteously. We thank you for him, and we thank you for the sacrifice that he accomplished on the cross for us. And we ask, Lord, for your help and in submitting ourselves to him and to his lordship in our lives. Father, we ask all of these things for our good and for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing hymn 511, The Solid Rock.
be seated for a minute. Just a few announcements before we uh, close this morning. First, I'd like to uh, call up Claudia uh, to give an announcement about an upcoming Christmas event for children. Good morning. Um, I want to say two quick things about the children's ministry. The first is we are beginning our children's Sunday school next Sunday, and we will have a preschool class for three and a half fours uh, and an elementary class for children who are in the elementary grades. So that will be at 9.15, the same time as the adults. So I hope you'll plan to come, bring your children. The younger children, if your parents want to come and stay in the class, that's fine. Uh, we're happy to have you, even the older kids. If you want to come and be a part of your children's Sunday school class, you're very welcome to come and stay and be with us. Number two, what is one thing that kids really get excited about? Christmas, yeah, Christmas. But not every child knows what Christmas means. And so this Christmas, we're going to show the kids around us the light and the love of God and the good news of Jesus Christ by throwing the ultimate Christmas party. So we're planning, and with your, I'm coming here because I need your support to become a part of the Children's Evangelism Fellowship annual Christmas event. It's called the Christmas Across America. And basically, you just throw a, an ultimate Christmas party and have a wonderful time. The CEF people uh, will provide the resources. Um, this two-hour event will be you know, games and songs, the Bible story, memory verses, um, and a craft, maybe some food. Um, so we have a lot to squeeze into a short time. And uh, I, want, I really would love to be able to do this. Um, it's going to be a really a fun evangelistic event. We're going to advertise it to the greater community for our kids, your friends, your family, and neighbors here in the community. Um, so the date we selected for the cr Christmas party is December 18, Saturday, 1 to 3. And how can you be a part? I thought of four quick things. We all start with a P. One is pray for our Christmas party as an outreach event and for our own kids, that they'll understand the real meaning of Christmas, the birth of Christ. Number two, participate on December 18 by coming out and volunteering. Number three, promote it to uh, your friends and your neighbors. And finally, praise God because he's powerful and he can do all things, including changing the lives of the children and their families. So today you can see me, if you like, quickly. If you think you want to know more about it, if you have an interest, um, you can see me. If you can't find me, you can see uh, Dawn Goodman. Is Dawn here? She's not here. Okay, don't see Dawn then. But you can see me. Pastor Steve is aware of what's happening. And just let him know you have an interest, and I'll get a hold of you. Um, he won't need to do that. But just let someone know that you have an interest. I'll be happy to talk with you. So thank you. Thank you for that, and I'm excited about what God is going to be doing in our children's ministry this year. Thank you, Claudia. We will pray. Uh, a couple of no more announcements. Uh, you're welcome to join us again this evening uh, for our evening service at 6 p.m., where we gather to pray and uh, to hear the word preached a little bit more, but uh, mostly to give ourselves to praying for one another. Uh, every Sunday school, uh, Sunday morning at 9.15 right here, we're working through political theology, the relationship between church and state. So if you're confused about that, like all of us are, uh, come and get not confused. We'll help you with that. Uh, Wednesday night, 7 p.m., we're working through the book of Titus. That's right here, Wednesday night. And, um, and then two, two, two more things here. Um, we have our Christmas Eve candlelight service. So that's Christmas Eve, December 24th. That'll be right here at 7 p.m. in conjunction with Aletheia Church. Uh, we invite you to come and worship with us then. And then lastly, uh, if you're a member, be sure, if you haven't done so already, to grab the proposed budget material that's out uh, on the coffee table, I think, out there. Um, a part of that is a packet uh, entitled Prince George's Conference on Reformed Theology. What is that? Well, that's a conference that we are hosting right here at Greenbelt Baptist Church next fall, the end of September, uh, in conjunction with the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. And uh, part of that is wrapped up into our budget, but um, we want you to be aware of that and, and how the elders are thinking through that. Uh, it'll be a great time, uh, two-day conference with uh, speakers and um, fun things going on. But uh, if you want to know more about that, yes, come talk to me, talk to the elders. 
but also there's a packet out there that goes along with the budget. You want that, if you remember, because next Sunday, this coming Sunday, December 5th, we will be voting on that budget and voting on everything wrapped up into that. So in order to be an informed voter, please make sure you grab that. All right, please stand for this morning's benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord look with favor on you, lifting up his countenance upon you and giving you his peace in the King and Prince of Peace, Jesus himself.